Well, good, good evening, everyone. If you could take a seat uh, reasonably quickly, and uh, we'd like to begin. So good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Goad. I'm the Chair of Architecture here at the Melbourne School of Design. And I'm also a co-director of ACAHUCH, the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural Heritage. On behalf of ACAHUCH and my fellow ACAHUCH directors, Professors Julie Willis and Hannah Louie, I'd like to welcome you all to this ICOMOS General Assembly event, the panel discussion, Heritage Changes or Does It? The University of Melbourne acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work, learn and live. The Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Budurong peoples at the Burnley, Fisherman's Bend, Parkville, Southbank and Werribee campuses. The Yorta Yorta Nation at the Dukey and Shepparton campuses and the Zha Zha Wurrung people on the Cresic campus. The university acknowledges and is grateful to its traditional owners, elders and knowledge holders of all indigenous nations and clans who've been instrumental in our reconciliation journey. We recognize the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We also acknowledge their enduring cultural practices of caring for country. We pay respect to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of indigenous knowledge in the academy. As a community of researchers, teachers, professional staff and students, we're privileged to work and learn every day with indigenous colleagues and partners. This evening, I'd like to thank Lovell Chen for the organization and sponsorship of tonight's event and hand over to our MC for the evening, Adam Mornament, a principal and director at Lovell Chen. So please welcome Adam. Thanks, Philip, and, and welcome. Um, I was going to say, by way of preliminary, that uh, I want to say a big thank you to the Melbourne School of Design and, and to Akka Hutch um, for hosting us this evening. So thank you very much to, to Philip, to, to, to Julie Willis, Hannah Louis and their colleagues, particularly Theo Blankley, who has been um, a pillar of support behind the scenes. As um, Philip's already mentioned, I was going to do an acknowledgement of country, um, to country. Perhaps I'll do that as well, actually. Um, I, I, I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathered this evening on the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples, the traditional custodians of this country. And I pay my respects to the Wurundjeri elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge the continued connection that the Wurundjeri people have with country, culture and knowledge sharing through storytelling debate and the exchange of ideas, a practice that brings us together this evening. I hope we can do justice to that tradition. Um, I also acknowledge the elders past and present on all lands from which those joining us remotely are located and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us this evening. Um, as Philip mentioned, this evening is a, a teaser event uh, for the ICOMOS General Assembly and Scientific Symposium, uh, which will be held in Sydney from late August. Richard Mackay, the convener for the GA, is with us this evening and will provide some further details um, later on. Uh, in broad terms, the theme for this evening's discussion relates to the overarching theme for the General Assembly Heritage Changes, which recognises that conceptions of heritage influence well, both influence and are influenced by the social, political and cultural con context in which it occurs. It is necessarily volatile and, and dynamic. The objective of this evening is to open up a discussion uh, about the relevance and purpose of heritage today. Uh, and we do that with an emphasis on the practice of heritage. Um, before going on, I'll note that Heritage Changes has also been adopted as the theme for the annual International Day for Monuments and Sites next month. And the title of the Heritage Council of Victoria's local government forum to be held in May uh, is Embracing Change. So it does begin to feel that there may be something in the air. Um, <clears throat> the genesis of this evening's uh, event is in a paper by Rodney Harrison, a professor of heritage studies at University College London. And the paper's titled, um, Forgetting to Remember, Remembering to Forget, Late Modern Heritage Practices, Sustainability, 
and the crisis of accumulation of the past. But the paper suggests that the process of forgetting is integral to remembering, that you cannot form new memories uh, uh, and attach value to them without also selecting some things to forget. Um, remembering in the context of the paper is described as an active process of cultivating and pruning. Harrison references the growth of heritage lists and registers that we've now been living with for over 50 years. And in all, almost all cases, they only grow. The inference is that judgments about cultural heritage significance are, are somehow immutable, fixed and enduring. But I, I think we all know that that's not the case. Conceptions of value evolve, cultural priorities change, processes of evaluating significance are not static in every generation has a distinct relationship with the concept of meaning as associated with place. Despite this, the process of reviewing existing assessments of significance are very much not the norm. As a result, these lists, which are already substantial, particularly in Victoria, keep growing. So the question occurs, can we look at this differently? Does there come a point where we choose to prioritize cultivating and pruning? And I don't see this as a particularly trivial or technical matter. It relates to public support for and understanding of heritage. And by that, I mean, does the growth of heritage of the places, does the growth of places that, we are, that are subject to statutory heritage controls risk undermining the effectiveness and intent of heritage? And I say this as a practitioner, and of course, I'm sure I'm not alone in seeing the imperfections in what we do. Um, this got me thinking about how far we've traveled from the origins of heritage legislation in the early 1970s, which was born of a certain clarity of purpose, with a sense of noble endeavor, driven by a popular commitment to protect natural and built environments. 50 years on, heritage is an embedded part of that landscape. It's part of what we do. Um, but are we do the, doing these things out of habit? Are we asking the right questions? Or have we become complacent? Continuing this logic, my mind turned to the idea of seeing heritage registers as collections, collections of places that have been assessed as significant um, over the past 50 years or more. And if you do that, how would a curator tend to these collections and sustain their relevance? And by extension, what might we, and by that using the fourth person, I'm referencing those involved in practices and processes associated with post-contact heritage, what might we learn from curatorial conventions? This line of logic broadened further to consider how we might learn from other related professions and exploring the possibility that the role of post-contact heritage in society might be reinvigorated through greater integration with social, economic, and environmental concerns. So having, I hope, um, set the scene, I'm, I'm delighted to be joined this evening by representatives of some of those professions. Um, in alphabetical order, um, Paul Carter, right next to me, um, has written extensively. He's a writer, artist, and professor of design, sorry. Uh, he's written extensively on white settler societies, their foundational myths, and the ways that they inform the places they create and the narratives that hold them together. He works with communities um, to identify shared creative aspirations, translating them into design propositions that express a sense of place. His public art projects have been installed across Australia, notably at Sydney Olympic Park and Melbourne's Federation Square, which is how I first became familiar with him and his work. Um, Richard Gillespie, um, curator and academic at the Faculty of Engineering here at the University of Melbourne. Richard collaborates with students and stakeholders to build and document collections and curates exhibitions on campus. Curatorial and heritage projects outside the university include collaborative work with traditional owners, trade unions, and local history groups. His distinguished career includes 25 years with Museum Victoria as a curator and as a design manager. Um, Amy Hubbard, at the end, uh, is a director and co-founder of CAPEA, a community engagement consultancy based in Melbourne. She's worked on over 500 community engagement projects uh, in Australia and overseas and has come to see that the affected, affected community's experience is often left out or, or overlooked. She's particularly interested in community resilience and strengthening of communities, her backgrounds in urban planning and design, and significantly for the purposes of this evening, her first professional role in planning and design was as a student placement at Heritage Victoria. Um, Melinda Kennedy and Heather Threadgold are co-directors of Muriel, um, an organization that provides heritage advice and consults on cultural perspectives, anthropology, landscape architecture, and embedded Aboriginal urban design. Heather, 
uh, works as a cultural heritage advisor, historian and anthropologist, and leads on landscape architecture. She is a member of the Heritage Advisory Committee for the City of Greater Geelong and embedded, uh, sorry, and lectures at Deakin Uni. Uh, Melinda also works as a cultural heritage advisor, focusing on Aboriginal knowledge systems, natural cultural resource management and perspectives, and narratives relating to urban design. She is a Wadarung traditional owner and a member of the Victorian Aboriginal Council. She also lectures at, at Deakin on Indigenous processes and narratives. So thank you all very much for being here this evening. We look forward to your thoughts and observations. Um, the format for this evening is that each presenter has a pre-agreed question or theme that they will talk to. And we'll talk to that theme for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and then we'll have around 20, 30 minutes or so for, for questions. And then hand to Richard Mackay, as I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so before handing first to, to Richard Gillespie, I've also been asked to say that it's very important you don't break any glasses in here. You, you, they asked me to mention that. <laughs> so, so, um, so um, having got through the preliminaries, Richard Gillespie, I'll ask you to come on. Get that. Remember what my question is. Thank you, Adam. Uh, can people hear me okay? Um, just if, if I'm dropped down, it's just I have cochlear implants and it can be a little hard to calibrate my volume to, to the crowd. Perfect, thank you. Um, the question that um, Adam really put to me was, can we regard heritage lists and registers as collections? And are there lessons that we can learn um, that might be learned from curatorial practices and conversations and conventions? Um, so I really want to look at the, some of these issues from the perspective of having worked at Museums Victoria as a curator and curatorial uh, sort of head for 25 years, and then more recently in a more sort of focused way uh, at uh, University of Melbourne. I've also done work on the history on research on the history of collections. So I'm very conscious, including items that have been deaccessioned from collections. So I'm very conscious of the ways in which collections have grown and then declined and shifted from one institution to another, uh, rediscovered and so forth as well, and the complexities involved in doing that. Um, I acknowledge too, there are real differences between heritage registers and museum collections, but I think there are a lot of similarities and there's really those things that I want us to focus on and, and think about uh, this evening. When I joined Museum Victoria in 1990, um, curators pretty much worked with the assumptions that once an item had entered a collection, it was there permanently. Um, acquisition proposals documented why the item was significant and should be in the collection, but they tended to do so in isolation. They were individual standalone uh, arguments. It was if the acquisition, I think, was an end in itself. And for curators, their professional identity was very much built around this sense of creating permanence uh, for future generations. So once you got an item and put it in the collection, you could stand back and say, fantastic, the job is done. It's, it's there and now safe for the future. After Melbourne Museum opened in 2000, we decided we really needed to start thinking more coherently and systematically, strategically about the collections. And we undertook what we called a collection analysis across something like 50 or 60 different uh, disciplinary collections across natural sciences, across history, across technology and indigenous cultures. And we argued we needed to understand the significance of each broad collection, its historical development, and its international and national comparisons in order to really give us focus for how we could acquire into the future, um, to understand what the proposed growth of different collections might be. There was also an awareness of the kind of storage issues. If we're just collecting more and more, do we have the capacity to store them? What's the environmental impact of the collections that we have stored under strict environmental conditions and so forth? And within each of those um, collection analyses, there was also a section headed with the D word, deaccessioning. Um, once we started looking at collections just holistically and historically, 
I think we recognized that collections had grown through those individual decisions at particular moments without necessarily looking at the acquisition in the context of the whole collection. So we started asking ourselves by weeding out items, can we actually make the collection more effective? We could then focus our resources on what really mattered and set priorities around those important collections. We could create space for new acquisitions, something that was always a good argument for curators who were resistant about the idea of letting something go. Um, and of course, as part of that, we needed a rigorous and deliberative process for if we were going to undertake our deaccessioning. In the context of heritage buildings, I thought it would be appropriate to look at the university's Parkville campus, seeing I'm working here now in sort of a heritage area. Um, there's the list of the items currently on the Victorian buildings on the Victorian Heritage Register. Um, and there are two collections that are objects or groups of items that are associated with CIRAC Computer and the Cunningham uh, Dax collection. Interestingly, the image I put up there as of a building that's dear to my heart because it's where I work in the Faculty of Engineering and Informa Information Technology, the engineering building, which is not on the register. And yet, as I do research on that building, I could argue, I think very cogently, than why it's actually a more, would be more legitimately up there than perhaps some of the, the others. That's not to say others should be taken off, but rather that we need to sort of think about uh, the buildings around this campus in a way that's more coherent. Now, I know Level Chen has in the past done sort of overarching surveys of the university collection, but there's not buildings, but there's not at the moment a basis for really thinking coherently and collectively, not just about the buildings as architectural elements, but their, their rich history. And if you, in fact, if you look, drill down and look into some of the entries on the Victorian Heritage Register for some of those buildings, in fact, the building, the, the very brief architectural statements uh, in terms of their architectural significance, a little touching on the use of the buildings, but sometimes the register actually relates to what they were at the time that it went onto the register. So neither of the law school is no longer in the old quad and there's no gallery any longer in the uh, physics building either. So the buildings have shifted, but the, but the Victorian Heritage Register statement has stayed the same. So current statements are significant, need to be updated and expanded. And while I'm conscious of very, of very good individual work that's been done on different buildings by heritage architects across the university, uh, Level Chen in particular, um, these are not readily accessible, uh, even for me, and are certainly not reflected uh, in the BHR and the register database. I want to shift now to think about how we facilitate community engagement with heritage. Why do we have collections? To make us feel good and part of history as collectors or to use collections to engage with community. After Melbourne Museum opened again, going back to my curatorial practices, we shifted attention to making the collections accessible to the public through digitization and online access. Um, so Museum Victoria collections, um, has something like, well, there's over a million items, but about um, 100,000 in the sort of history and technology in the heritage space. Um, it wasn't just a question of publishing existing information. We had to actually transform the quality of the information on the collection database as we set standards for publishing. Um, the, an item on collections online with good metadata to facilitate searching and utilizing a sophisticated uh, relational database to integrate information. The other thing we did was realize it's not about individual objects, it's about, it's about the historical narratives and themes that can tie stories together in the collection. And so there's something like, I think, 1,500 historical narratives now that intersect between groups of objects and larger historical uh, themes. So um, the canoe, the, at the bottom, there's, a, there's an essay around early Melbourne, but then it ties back to uh, 
an Aboriginal bark canoe collected in Melbourne in the 1860s. Uh, equally, we explored a whole series of other narratives and again tied them back to individual uh, images and collections. The purpose of collections online then was not just to make the database accessible, but to rethink and organize the kinds of information we considered essential in order to make sense of the collection and the broader historical themes that the items spoke to. That in turn gave us a clearer view of the collections, their strengths, their weaknesses and potential areas of acquisition and deaccession. Heritage, of course, is as much about awareness and sense of the collective appreciation of our histories as much as it is about listings and controls. It would be worth asking, could the Victorian Heritage Register, rather than being that list of individual buildings, actually become a kind of broader mechanism for educating and building community awareness around heritage that would list both the individual buildings but those larger historical narratives? I know there has been conversations in the past and some work being done on this, but it's still not reflected in the way that it, it actually engages with the public on that. I did also work um, while at Melbourne Museum, Museum Victoria, on the Golden Mile Heritage Trail, which I think is an interesting example of where we did try and tell a larger story across a series of heritage buildings within the city. Uh, this is around 2000 that got launched. That involved and was very much driven by the Melbourne Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, Heritage Victoria, um, Ray Tonkin and Peter Hiscock were involved in that, the City of Melbourne, the Museum, Old Treasury Building, and Graham Davison worked as the historian pulling together that. We then installed plaques right through the city. Um, there are remnants of those plaques are still in place. Um, as that implies, there were all kinds of maintenance and operational uh, challenges in maintaining it. We did then shift to a, um, a tour app, a, a, um, an app that allows you to navigate through it. And it remains the basis for our professional tour guides, tours through the city uh, as well. But I think what is interesting in the context of the Golden Mile is that it provided a systematic cross-organizational approach where different organizations could bring their relative strengths and experience and ways of interpreting heritage uh, into a kind of collective endeavor. It's split apart again, but I think perhaps that kind of approach is what we need again. So there's really two simple ideas I wanted to get across. Items, whether objects, buildings or sites, only truly become significant in the context of seeing them as part of a larger assemblage, as collections and exemplars of larger historical narratives. And secondly, for effective public appreciation of heritage, there need to be effective modes of communication, discovery, engagement, and conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, keen to circle back to some of those ideas of um, sustaining relevance, um, if we can, later on in the evening. Um, the next speaker is Amy Hubbard who will be addressing the following question. Thank you, Amy. I think it's a very good lead on from the, from the first presentation. Um, so my question that I hope to answer tonight uh, is, is there space for expert opinion and community sent sentiment in heritage? Now, Adam made mention before that my first professional role was at Heritage Victoria 25 years ago. So I was an urban planning undergrad and um, my six months at Heritage Victoria uh, did, did have an impact, but it made me very quickly move into social planning and community <laughs> engagement. Um, and I, I still remember, Jeremy, I think you were a PhD student at the time. You won't remember me, but you were the, the ball of energy in the office. And um, I can remember thinking, you know, the VPPs and the introduction to the of the heritage overlay at the time uh, wasn't the, going to be the be all and end all of my career. But uh, well, I have overlapped. Uh, I've overlapped with Heritage Victoria and those heritage overlays many times since. 
Now, as, as an expert in community engagement, I think it's, it's always good to remind people what community engagement is and what it is not. And to understand community sentiment, we need to undertake engagement. So a lot of politicians, uh, a lot of sometimes experts, but a lot of politicians will hide behind this term engagement. And until you define what it actually is, it doesn't mean anything at all. And in the world that I work in planning and design and policy, community engagement boils down into sort of three main areas. And we've tested this a lot over 16 years because I have clients, often they're planners, often they're architects, and they'll say, we want to engage. And I'll say, what do you mean? And they're like, well, we don't know. We just want to engage. It's like, okay, let's try and understand what you mean because I don't want to waste your time. I definitely don't want to waste the community's time. And let's make this process of some value to the experts and the decision makers. Okay. So the three areas are informed decisions. And this has really sprung out of, you know, in Victoria, the very first Planning and Environment Act. Okay. And since then, I think we've got about another 15 or 16 individual pieces of legislation, plus the Charter of Human Rights and a whole of other things that say you have to engage. Okay. It even stipulates what it could look like. And over time, we've got better at that. So engagement, community engagement can be about informing decisions associated with planning, policy and design. I think you all understand that in this room. The second part of it is building understanding and knowledge. And that can be through, you know, might be through the golden mile, it might be through online resources, but it's about building the capacity of the community to understand what heritage is and what it is not. What the different layers and lenses could be within a conversation about heritage. And finally, it is about relationships. Okay, if you don't think about those relations through the engagement process, trust becomes diminished uh, and it's very difficult to, to move on in a process or project, especially if you're dealing with kind of complex cultural landscape, you're working with, you know, different types of stakeholders with different interests in a, in a place or a policy. So I'm pretty confident um, that most of the engagement that we do around planning policy design fits within these three areas. We've had people before uh, working on very large road projects uh, in New South Wales come to us and say, but our engagement doesn't fit into any of these. And it's like, well, it's probably not engagement. You're doing something called public relations. You're doing something called risk management. That's okay. Call it what it is. Okay. So um, I just want to read out this quote to you. So everything in my community has heritage value, the buildings, the streets, the parks, the gardens. I don't want to see any change here. We want everything to stay the same. So a few years I was working on a project with East Melbourne residents, okay? But I was also working on a structure plan for Central Broad Meadows. And it was quite a few years ago. So I was, I was in the data. I was doing the facilitation. I was doing the Vox Pops. We are doing design charrettes. But I was also, you know, I, lo I love um, the qualitative data. I love hearing the stories. Identical quotes to very different people. A resident, a uh, representative of East Melbourne Residents Association, this one it said this, but also uh, a, a resident of Central Broad Meadows also said the same thing. And that got me thinking and that got me testing this notion does doesn't matter what the community really looks like and what the diversity socioeconomic diversity cultural diversity are they all thinking the same things and I kind of think most of the time they they are because people don't like change and you know planning policy and design is a change process so the pub test when I go to the pub people say what do you do and I say um okay uh well, I trained as an urban planner I done a bit in international development maybe I'm an urban planner maybe I'm a social planner community engagement do you know what that is and they go nah and I say I work in change in the community like change management in the community and they go I get it so you know community engagement is about a change process communities don't like change so how do you how do you work with communities when cities are changing and evolving all the time so my observations about heritage and engagement so um Kapia, we've been around for 16 years. We've gone from two people to over 30 people in, that, in um, those, those 16 years. 
And the de demand for engagement is actually directly correlate, correlating, I think, with the demand for information. So social media and engagement, people want information, they want to be part of things. So there's just more and more of a demand and we're part of more and more conversations. So communities use heritage as a catch all for places and spaces they want to preserve or protect. It's about heritage. Is it really? Is it really about heritage? Maybe it's about something else that you feel connection to that, that space or that place. Most communities want to acknowledge and understand the past before they can start imagining the future. And it might be the past from thousands of years ago. It might be the past from 50 years ago. But generally, people want to look backwards before they can look forwards. And sometimes they need to kind of tie up loose ends and understand and, and acknowledge what's happened in the past and feel, feel okay with that. They may not feel comfortable with it before they can start heading into the future. Also, heritage can be an exclusive conversation. I think, I think you probably recognise that. Um, it's not accessible to many in the community. Even though people will say, you know, I want to protect this, this neighbourhood because of the heritage. They, they don't go deeper into it because they don't have that literacy around talking about heritage. So what are we mostly doing wrong, planners, architects, you know, policy makers around heritage? Well, we're not breaking down heritage for the community to, to look at places and spaces through different lenses and layers. We can be quite lazy, you know, asking for feedback on a heritage plan that's not engagement, that is disengagement. Break it down. Um, leaving the community out of the heritage conversation until there is a threat or a risk, okay? So going through a strategic planning process, going through a design process, then the community uh, opposes it. Uh, there is outrage. There could even be a protest if you're lucky. And then, uh, then there, is, there is this pointy point and this need for a conversation about heritage. So it's reactive. There's a little opportunity for experts and community members to come together. And more, so many times I've worked with, uh, you know, designers around places and spaces and they're, and they're sort of like, you know, we'll, we'll go out and listen to the community, but I've got the design already here, ready to go. So many times. And it's kind of, it's a utopia moment. But, you know, it, it, it happened to us just a couple of weeks ago. It's still happening. Respect the community, respect your stakeholders, bring them into the conversation. Um, and not giving the community the time and space, uh, the community the time and the space to understand the role of heritage, what it is and what it is not. Now, I did quite a bit of work on the, uh, the Preston market a few years ago. And the Preston market, I'm not going to say very much on it because I am a Darabin resident and I could get in trouble, but um, I was a convener of a community reference group there. And everything at, at the end of the day, it boiled down to um, the, the Preston market was the heart of the community. But now they're looking at the heritage value of the structure of the market, which is, you know, it's really interesting, but I'm not going to make any more comment on it. I just, there's a whole lot to be said about that. Anyway, how can heritage lit literacy be improved? So what have we got here? We've got, we need to give people space to share their personal heritage, um, talking about the past, talking about their experiences, what they value, really important. Um, build appreciation of cultural heritage benefits and the community's role in celebrating heritage. We need to be shifting the heritage conversation away from architectural preservation to one that focuses on community values, I think a lot of the time. Um, and dispel misconception that heritage is old and reframe heritage is ongoing and living and all around them. Because people, when we do engagement, they do go into this heritage black hole. They dig their heels in. It's like it's more than that. It is living. It is all around you. It's evolving. And cities are too. Uh, bring young people into the heritage conversation. Really, really important. So mindful of time. Uh, <laughs> Is there space for expert opinion and community sentiment in heritage? Yes, but we need to create the space. Okay, so to do that, you know, we can build, we can build heritage literacy to make it inclusive and accessible. Okay. Uh, create forums for experts and community members to come together and to share and connect and that ongoing engagement to build knowledge and trust. So they're just a few ideas. Thanks every, everyone, we'll see you at the end.
Thanks very much, Amy. Um, I love that Preston Market reference. Yeah, is that <clears throat> ask, you, you follow a process that ends up being a situation where all the wrong questions are being asked. It's um, something we can perhaps return to later on. But, um, and I'm also interested to, to hear more about that, the screening effect of, of engagement as a term, as a term that people hide behind. Um, they think they're doing it, but they're not really delivering. And I'm, I've wondered, I don't know, perhaps this is a question for later on, but whether heritage is an equally problematic term. It means so many things to so many, dif to, to so many different people. You wonder whether it's still a useful term. But um, enough of that. Now to Paul Carter to take us through harvesting the future. Paul. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting there very nervously for my question, but I wasn't quite sure what my question was. And I thought, okay, so I've got some notes for what I might uh, share with you. And I thought, can I retrofit the question onto the front? So it looks like an exploratory divagation rather than just a repetition. But um, it seems that there is this question in there somewhere, and I'm sure you'll help me elicit it. Um, I'm not from the official heritage industries in fact I don't probably have a heritage really um, so I operate um, interstitially parasitically and opportunistically across various disciplines and by the seat of my pants would get away with it so I'll be asking your indulgence this evening um, but in the context of thinking of heritage from outside um, the sort of architectural box um, what I thought I might do is just say a little bit briefly uh, about um, the um, potential of heritage from the point of view of what I'll call uh, creative uh, reinterpretation. Um, so not so much thinking about uh, curatorial aspects or for that matter, the, the, obviously the fundamental work of, of um, creating uh, a debate, an informed debate about what constitutes value in the community. Talk a little bit about um, the role of uh, creative artists who, after all, uh, find themselves um, working with different stories and different histories, but not doing it probably in quite the strict manner of um, a heritage expert. Um, so I've got two, two main ideas. Um, and the first idea is really about these things that get listed, um, that many items on the heritage register doesn't, it pretty much doesn't matter where you're talking about landscapes, you're talking about um, buildings or intangible heritage. Um, these achievements of the past um, were con themselves conceived as templates for future growth and change. They were often conceived as um, seeds that would flower in the future. And this would happen whether it was through the repetition of certain acts of resacralization whether it was through uh, ceremonies that would continue to uh, vivify, uh, animate, and otherwise interpret uh, the physical structure, or it could be the stars. So there was a process in which what became valuable uh, was proportioned to its utility as a future direction, not in terms of its past, but in terms of what it might be as an observatory for the future ordering of society. Um, and I had, um, some very a simple example was even if you think about something like a so in other words these things which we now think of as heritage there's a sub story here uh, such as a bicycle uh, obviously it was designed to have what we at RMIT love to call impact so the whole point about the bicycle was not that it was going to go into the heritage category it was going to go into the use category but a few years ago I was involved in this is a sub story I was involved in a, uh, a, a museum in Silicon Valley and I don't know why, but we had we had all these carbon bicycles. And they were the same material that's used for building rockets or something. Anyway, they were very proud of this new material. And I had to write in a sort of Californian sort of style, um, a heritage statement for these bicycles. So there you go. So the, the, the cycle of the cycle is very rapid. <laughs> but the point is they were seen when they were constructed as part of a, a future spin-off. And now suddenly they were in the past. So the this, <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> I quite know what to make of that. But of course, it is true, as we know, in many cultures that the value 
of heritage depends in destroying it utterly and rebuilding it constantly. The Malay, traditional Malay house is a classic example of that. It's not healthy if it's old. Of course, its form is constant, or it, but it's constantly evolving, being taken apart, renewed and changed. And the vitality of that process of creative reinvention is what grants the house its aura and its capacity to maintain generations there. So that's one point I wanted to make, was that many cultural achievements of the past were, as it were, in their instantiation, oriented towards future uses. And by future, I don't mean a kind of planning future. I mean an embedded, immersive enactment of, of custom, uh, of law, in the ever-present here and now. So this is leads probably to the second point, is that really the value of heritage is inseparable from its reinterpretation. Um, so it doesn't matter uh, whether um, you are talking again <clears throat> about um, an interactive a, a landscape and ecology, whether you are talking about a site with particular associations. Um, invariably, the value is associated in some sense with a creative potential that continues to reside. It will call it an energy, something that captures the imagination. And where the custodians of those places reside, um, it's embodied. It's embodied in a set of aesthetic or cultural or creative practices. And they're not repetitions, they continually evolve and change. So with those two points in mind then, one, that the heritage objects themselves were future oriented, and secondly, that they really mean nothing unless we actively engage in their reinterpretation. Harvesting the future, if you like, occurs when uh, the past provides creative potential for something new to happen. And this is not a representation of what was there before. It's not like sort of making an animation to show you how it was in 1800 or whatever. It's about something which is called rather grandly concomitant production. In other words, it's an equivalent process of creation, which entrains in some way channels uh, aspects of the, the, the value, the creative vision that's already embedded in that site. If that's the case, then creative practice is a legitimate mode of heritage protection interpretation. And if we're talking about deaccessioning, it gives you a very good way of seeing whether or not something should be deaccessioned. I can't see anything moving me in that piece anymore. Um, but perhaps the artist will find out for us. So these premises, as I already indicated, uh, come from somebody who's not got a background in uh, a pr proper science, let alone um, social science, but essentially as a writer. And so I'm primarily interested in the way that language creates architectures of, of commonality. And of course, in these days produces extraordinary divisions, rhetorical divisions that are murderous. I'm very interested in the way that we use language creatively. And you can make a, a parallel with the way that heritage operates. So you can have a dictionary, which contains a vocabulary in one, two, three languages, that's heritage, but of course it's useless until you actually use it. And so every creative act, whether it's a poem, a work, of, a work of journalism, or the everyday conversation you hear on the tram, is the enactment of heritage. And without that enactment, the heritage itself uh, ceases to lose its currency, ceases to lose its capacity to generate uh, new forms of coexistence. Um, so I'll just... Um, so I've been involved for quite a long time in doing... Uh, what are called public artworks. We didn't go into the sort of what quite what they are, but the, essentially they involve a negotiation between received stories, um, new places, and uh, trying to embed through the process of concomitant production certain potentials, almost like DNA for future possibilities. Um, so, um, with the ground writing that I did at, oh yeah, you can see it. Oh, we've got two, very good. Two Federation Squares, wow. There's enough contention about one of them, two of them. Um, so the object there was to create, um, shall we say, a, a template. So the, the big kind of spiral pattern was uh, a, a gesture towards a kind of choreography of meeting 
as you know, the, the place wasn't there. It's a suspended platform. It sits over um, Bunyarong and Wurundjeri land. It sits just adjacent to the Yarra. Um, it has a strange kind of uh, non-existence like Federation itself. It's an aspiration. And so I was interested in how one might sort of future orient this thing towards becoming something. Uh, and so the ground writing I did there is a set of prayers or invocations, which um, exactly as we were hearing before, go back to different pasts in order to recreate, reshape them in, in language, in words and typography and that kind of thing. Anyway, the point I'm really getting at is there was, uh, as it were, a new place coming into being, but the object was not to try and do a heritage study of Federation in Australia. Um, it was to acknowledge, and one would have to spend some time to explain how it happens, uh, the very complex heritage of forgetting and remembering that was involved in that process of, of co um, consolidated colonization. So what I want to just very briefly, so I'm not sure if I've my time, um, to offer you three ways in which creative practice can be um, useful in the interpretation of heritage. And one case is where uh, there is a palimpsest of unrealized projects. Um, any architect or designer in the room will know exactly what I'm talking about. So, because you know, in, in, your, in your working archive, you have 90% of the unrealized projects and the 10% the ones you actually got. So places are like that themselves. They, we're talking about community engagement. I mean, the larger part of community consciousness is dark matter. It's what actually never became visible in the design. So that's the first thing, to talk about how a creative approach can actually uh, release what might be called um, the energy of unrealized projects. And so in this particular case at Victoria Harbour, this is before it became um, Docklands as it is today. This was a but slightly over 20 years ago, so that you might have been involved with the charrettes, and Lendlease did the charrettes when they were trying to think of a different way of developing a plan <clears throat> for the development of Victoria Harbour. And I was commissioned to come up with a set of concept designs for a multiplicity of, of meeting places. Um, and on the left-hand side is the sort of the rotate, the, the, what I came up with is no wonder we didn't get it built. <laughs> now I'm excited by it and I just think we really need to get behind it. <laughs> a lot of people here, you know, are probably dragging their feet. Anyway, so it has a pattern, it has a, it has a star pattern that has profound significance in both um, Kulin nations cultures and also in um, navigational cultures coming from the Northern hemisphere. Um, and it has another, of, a number of other uh, components. But if you look on the, the right-hand side, this is just a detail of one of the, the draft palimpsest drawings. And it's simply a drawing composed of, of six unrealized projects for Victoria Harbour. And in a way that I won't bore you with, they become absorbed into the future patterning of that landscape. So it was a simple example where this was a creative engagement. It wasn't based on um, a, a functional analysis of you know, where you're going to put the coffee stands and things like that. It was simply, well, hey, this is, the, this is something that's happening in this particular marshland, marsh area, um, which has all sorts of in, very interesting interstitial and fluid harmonics that go with it and so on. That's what I came up with. Now, thank you very much, Paul. Very excited by that. Now, we do have a number of other items. <laughs> More recently, uh, to a project which illustrates another possibility for creative practice as a creative, as a cultural heritage. Um, mechanism. And this is where a foundational place story has been utterly displaced. And this was the case at Yegan Square in Perth, where belatedly in the process of building a new city square in the middle of Perth, uh, the then Premier decided to name it after Yegan. And Yegan was a freedom warrior from the early period of invasion colonization, and he was beheaded. He was betrayed and he was beheaded. And the story is deeply shocking. Um, perhaps we shouldn't be shocked given how frequently these things did happen in that period. Nevertheless, it was shocking to the public consciousness and it placed at the heart of the beginning a reminder of the end of what had actually been involved in the taking over of that country. So there we were. Uh, and I was invited to work with the <coughs> Noongar reference group, it was actually a project reference group with Baladong people in it to discuss, well, what do we do with this? And the first point to make was that we, 
that there was no possibility of a positive representation. There was not going to be a consolidation of meeting. There was always this great thing, like engagement. Oh, it's going to be a meeting place. What, no, actually, nobody wants to meet. Thank you very much. They'd really like you to go away. So we had um, a, a process of, of storytelling. It was a truth-telling process. Uh, one of the particular characters that came out of that was another resistance fighter, Uriel, who's known in English as Fanny Balbuk. And um, her resistance was very situationist. Um, she insisted on walking straight to the places that belonged to her with her, her wana, with her uh, digging stick, and she just simply knocked down the fences and opened the doors and went straight through, um, caused the colonials a lot of trouble. Um, but Uriel was a very important figure in discussing um, displacement as a present absence and the holes, if you like, in the fabric of reality, trauma, psychic landscapes, that were there. Um, so out of that, we built, um, on, the, on the left, you can see the Lions um, IPH design and with the, the tower with the Ramus illuminations on it. But my role was to translate, if you like, under the direction of the Nunga to people that I was working with into a set of energy patterns that, just, that show seismic shifts and drifts um, that, that didn't make for easy reading. So that was the, the energy pattern we drew over it. And then um, it got translated into various things. Uh, probably the most important diagram here is the string figure, which became a symbol of how you have to pull apart in order to be together. And in fact, unless you have that tension, which is based on a recognition of sovereignty, um, it's always going to be, you know, white fell away. Um, above um, is part of the opening celebrations, or the top, top square. And on the right, just one of seven components oh, right to the one of seven components of an artwork called passenger which was um uh gifted to me as a as an artwork project which um tells the story of uriel and we changed the english alphabet we just put the digging stick straight through it um, but the point there is that a foundational place story had been displaced and it was very hard for um, people committed to positive statuary and positive memorialization to know what you do with a negative. But I think in a creative practice, especially if it's coming from uh, a strong community, uh, you can deal with the absences in a way that um, is more effective. So a heritage in this case of displacement. And the third um, example I wanted to give was a case where you do have um, a heritage overlay that's recognized but it's an overlay that's been done in such a way that it's stripped the, um, the site of its real meaning. And this was the case in Sydney when we worked on a project at the Darlington campus for Sydney Uni. Um, I'm not sure you can make it out because it's very small, I apologize, but at the corner of where it says street and map, there is the word the Golden Grove, Golden Grove Hotel. And the Golden Grove Hotel, um, had been the site of a huge heritage battle, actually a battle between the university and uh, the Darling community. Anyway, eventually it was destroyed, but the name remained. But the interesting thing was that one reason why uh, I think it, it didn't gain a great deal of traction was because nobody looked at the name. Um, the name was uh, simply applied to a building that had vernacular heritage. It was part of the, the local community's meeting place and you can work out the rest of yourself. But in fact, Golden Grove um, is um, uh, a name also given to the Seven Sisters, to the Pleiades, which of course in, in, in most, uh, I don't speak across um, none, um, our experts here, but obviously it's a very important story right through Australia. Um, but particularly in this context, in Gadigal land, it was, had very strong allusion also to a particular birthing place on that site, which was characterized by golden wattles. So there was a golden grove, which was actually associated with women's business. We also found, of course, that it was a first fleet ship that brought supplies to the colony. We then discovered on this very same site, the first golden grove experimental farm was constructed that was important in providing supplies when the ships didn't come in. Um, and by the time that we had built our Troy, nine-layered Troy of names, through a poetic process, 
of recollection and interpretation, um, we then had the basis for a reinterpretation of the whole site. And so in the image on the right, the Pleiades are laid out as a ground pattern, and each of the Pleiades then generated uh, a text or a set of um, um, typographies, and we created a stencil text. So stencil, the word stencil is where it means uh, where the star shines through from the darkness. And so we created a stencil text, and then we created a set of um, ground patterns that commemorated this, this same story. So there were the three little instances I just wanted to, to uh, share, because in each case, we found that by looking at the heritage from a different point of view, particularly as a future potential, as a seed yet to be unfolded, and then working with, um, in the case, obviously, um, in, in, in Melbourne and in uh, Sydney and in Perth, working under the direction and uh, with the endorsement of local knowledge holders, we were able to create something new and different. I'm not saying how much, uh, how, yeah, whether it succeeds or not, or how you, how you measure that, but it was certainly a way of taking forward um, different aspects of the past. In one case, understanding that something that was an aspiration for the future had yet to be realized. In another, that an aspiration in the past had never been realized. And in the third case, uh, an aspiration had been displaced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was fascinating. And that uh, engagement with that idea of creating new forms of dialogue um, leads very nicely to the final speakers, um, uh, Heather and, um, and Melinda from Muriel. Thank you. Okay. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say Nyura Narek Melinda Kennedy, Warang Barangirk, Waraki Dama Nyaro, Warangri Ja. So I just a little bit of language. So thank you. Thanks, Melinda. And we can just sort of talk together, but talk to you and um and give a little bit of a different presentation. Um our question is visibility. Um, European and Aboriginal con conceptions of heritage embody philosophies that are fundamentally divergent. From an applied perspective, are there opportunities for nourishment between heritage and culture? And if so, what are the priorities? That covers a lot, really. <laughs> <laughs> so within that question will be various questions. Um, and the way we are producing our... Oh, well, did that not come up? No. Sorry, I'll get used to this computer. So we are actually doing the opposite of what you were saying, Amy, and we're going to start with the future and take you back. Um, so we're going to unpick the the place and space and bring back to culture because we're going back to the past using history to think about the future in a cultural heritage perspective. So we've got two parts to the question that we're going to break down, and that is um, Aboriginal concepts of heritage, particularly cultural heritage. And then we're going to talk a little bit about emphasis for change. So um, we're sort of talking to the slides, but we're sort of not. So you'll see this, this um, brings together a, a, a picture, doesn't it, of a yeah. certain place. Unfortunately, I've made Heather come to my way. <laughs> so I must admit half of that question, I say, just give it to me in layman terms. I say that to my professor too. But what it, the reason why we do it this way when we present, it's very much the way that we did it in my culture. So there was no grandstanding. There was no standing in front and talking at people. It was about everyone being together and we spoke together, including children, including elders. And it was a learning experience from all, not just from one. But even though I can't say that because I'm a lecturer, so if my students are watching, don't ever hear that you're meant to just listen to me. So, 
So that's in the way we do do our presentations. And when it comes back to what we're talking about, bringing back the landscape, we always sit there and we actually, we, we're meant to work, but we talk into, we get right into these great lectures and talking about what, what this means. And we came up with this form because I kept saying, but I see it all. Like, how can you not see what I see? Like, that river may not be there or that creek is not there anymore. But to me, I still see the creek. I still see my mountain. I still see all of this. How can we show people what I see? And this is where this, is, this model had started from showing people what we yeah. are saying but also making sure that it's actually from um, knowledge, but also research. Yeah, so it's that notion of visibility, um, you know, for the lay person, um, non-Aboriginal person, um, how do you visualise um, a, a cultural landscape, particularly uh, living spaces or, or settlement or civilization? Um, and, and this is, this is where cultural heritage comes into place as a, as a um, process and disciplinary. But um, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to explain, isn't it? For instance, the, the notion of settlement, particularly when um, you lean upon uh, archaeology. Archaeology is looking at evidence of refuse. And so in the discipline of archaeology, which is mostly European, you're looking at refuse of, of, of structures um, as well as rubbish or identity through clay pots, for instance. But because Aboriginal um, culture and society is all about um, leaving very little and having very little in place, it's extremely top-level sustainability and environmental practices that there is very little to see. And so the notion of refuse, for instance, is you could sort of put it in the, the form of middens, um, which are, uh, shell deposits, shell deposits. Um, representing... I like to call it recovery centres. Recovery centres. Okay, centers. That, that's we were a the good first. We were the first, see? We, we had all this sorted. But obviously, in the way of the eyes of others, they thought we were quite behind, but... I read this amazing paper about why didn't we invent the wheel? Mm -hmm. Have you ever put a cart in the back of a kangaroo? <laughs> you wouldn't get far, would you? So why did we invent the wheel? Why didn't we invent the wheel? Because we didn't need the wheel. We invented the canoe. We, we never, ever took too much. So to come to that understanding of what it means for me is that I don't separate myself to landscape. I am landscape. We don't, we don't value ourselves higher than the landscape. And there's also this notion that I, I pass on to my students and when they're trying to ask me, what does culture mean to you? What, what is it? And I have got it down to one short little answer is, you may see a mountain, but allow me to see my uncle. And I think that's where it all comes to is that when I see country, I don't see country as in, oh, geez, I want to climb that mountain, have a look and see how much country I own because actually I don't own any, still paint it off just like everyone else. I know what you all think. But, um, you know, it, it was never like that. It's always that is superior to me. So all of it is more like I am it. I come from country. I will go to country. So, so how do we make that? How do we make that visible, and how do we include that and incorporate that in cultural heritage processes? Um, so, before we delve into you know the processes and emphasis for for change, um, you know which there are many, and we won't be going through them all by dot point. Um, I also we also just want to point out the notion of monuments too um in in landscapes so so cultural landscapes um is you know a term that we're all grasping we're also grasping the notion of cultural um culture cultural place um and most importantly people um but in 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 this mix of uh of of, of assessment for cultural heritage which really really sits along um the lines of of again archaeological practice of um, geomorphology, 
Um, we were looking at formations, ancient landscapes, and and then recognised um, formations. So that's a that's a term term of visibility, I guess, in cultural or cultural heritage. But monuments and land formations are, are very different. Like you just mentioned, that you see an ancestor when you look at at, at, at a place. So. So I guess, for instance, you, you, there's plenty of examples, but the Yu Yang's um, ranges down on your country. Yes. Um, there is a monument on top of that. Uh, yep. There's a, a, we had many of um, also sculptured monuments that we, we made in my country, many. <laughs> we just don't show you really. Um, but yes, there is a, a man there that we call Lowen. Lowen's laid to rest there and he's made of granite and you would see him. But also when we speak of that, there's even a well there that's predated 15,000 years old. And unfortunately to me, I feel like sometimes, why do we deny this, that we have this history in Australia? I always find it fascinating that, you know, I travel overseas and they show me a 400-year-old bonsai and I was meant to be excited. I'm like, what, oh, really? Is that it? <laughs> like, and, and that's what we do with mob. We actually have a little bit of a, you know, well, I've got something this sold and, and things like that. But to us, we talk like that. And I think it actually makes me very sad that none of our things that we have built and made is recognised due to terra nullius, as we know. And and there is a heritage monument on the Yu Yangs, which is Matthew Flinders. Yes. Um, Why not have the guy that killed you up there? It's always great, isn't it? Um, and that's the thing, you know, it's still called Flinders Peak. Um, and there's, you know, I won't say what school, wouldn't be hard. Um, we'll, we'll still continuously teach that. My nephew came home to show me that Matthew Flinders discovered the Yu Yang. I'm like, really? Are we still at this point? Um, but the Yu Yang, obviously, um, you can see that from very far. Obviously, for me, that's my marker. I know where North is. Obviously, if I get the other side, I'm, I'm buggered. But um, you know, it's my country, it's everywhere I see, you know, I see my country, I see my mountains, I know that also the place we're talking about here, as you can see, Lake Kunawari, which is Kunawara, the black swan. So Kunawara, um, it is a Ramsar site. Um, I would like to see most of my waterways all World Heritage listed because we are starting to forget what's keeping us alive. Now, um, with Kunawara, um, the Black Swan, there's a beautiful story. There's another story called Lao Lao Falls. Lao Lao Falls is another part of my country where Bunja went to sleep and went to the sky world. Punawara is Bunja's wife. So that's why with my job to be also a water expert in my country for my mob is my job is to make sure that that system never disconnects because I can't let Bunja and Kunawara separate because for everyone else, they're probably like, oh, well, you know, that wouldn't really matter. But for me, that was a law that was set, a cultural law that was set for us to make sure that humanity lives on. So in my eyes, if I let that disconnect, that means that they will end up, there's none of, that we won't be here anymore. So for me, um, it's a lot deeper. But, you know, what a lovely story about, you know, Bunjil and Kunawara. So this is um, one of our bringing it back to what uh, it once was. Um, and you can see all the, you can go there all the time and see all the Kunawaras there. But when you see the word worry in my country, that means when you're going to the ocean. So even when you go down to cultural heritage, there's these beautiful names that we all use. You know, we've got Nanawaring, we've got Jilang, we've got, you know, Wirbi, we've got Bellarat. All of them are our names. But they weren't named just because it was a place. That's what's so beautiful about the methodology of our naming. It was so much more uh, information in that name. So when I look at the Bowen River, which, you know, was the Bari Wari Yalak, which means the mountain to the ocean. But if I was going from the ocean to the mountain, it'd be Wari Bari. So there's all these things that we did to make sure that we knew where we were going and um, not that we ran around all the time. <laughs> That's another story. We didn't run around all the time. We had homes. Sorry to tell you all. 
we did plan <laughs> we were the we were planners and we were architects and we built houses we had structures and we even had families and kids believe it or not <laughs> but this is the thing about with our cultural heritage it's always disconnected yeah and it's and it's difficult when like talking back to um land formations and and monuments you know uh, such as the yu yangs or other um you know hills and everything has its place and and so they're in danger um, through the process of, of development, residential urban development, um, and and even things like wind turbines, you know, there's there's a, a, a special place that does have a turbine right on the top of it. Um, that some of these hills are being carved out, and um, uh, the re visibility um, is unrecognisable. And then, how do people connect to country when when that's in danger? So. Look, we're always slipping in and out of parallel um, universes as heritage advisors, cultural heritage advisors. We, we, there's an emphasis on um, background research on, on history and heritage and, and um, significant ground disturbance. So we're spending, you're spending a lot of time um, post-colonial with a little time of, of, of pre-colonial, which is often um, sometimes written into, you know, cultural heritage management plans in a very you know, copy paste type dialogue without this sort of um, understanding level of, of, of visibility, which is, which is important because we're presenting um, <laughs> history now in the present for the future. And so we're, we're sort of rehashing um, history alongside um, the, the practice of cultural heritage and recognition of cultural heritage, which is housed into the private domain of the register, the collection, um, which most people don't see for good reason, because it's it's important not to. But sometimes even Aboriginal people don't see that collection, don't see where that information um, goes. So well, it, at the moment, cult, cultural heritage is sort of, is it's in a stagnant place because there's so much more to put into to the process than, than looking at the geology, than, than looking at, okay, you've got um, the, the refuse, the, the shell middens, the overlay is um, accentuated uh, along waterways, whereas it's very well known that there's settlements that existed inland and on stony rises and other places. So it, it's in a it's in an awkward place. Um, and we th we think that you know anthropology is a is a great di discipline for this alongside cultural knowledge because um, field work is a really good practice that we no longer really we, we we still practice I'm an anthropologist but it's um it's changed over time and and, and field work being out on the ground making site specific um, cultural heritage important it, it, it takes time and we need to take that time we need to do it in your way really um which is which is important isn't which it which is inclusive of people and this is the problem with the cultural heritage process is that we're always putting people in the past and site use in the past and places in the past I feel in the past <laughs> So, I am always still put in the past and I'm here and I think I'm standing here. It's okay. Um, you know, that's also very hard. Um, that it is always spoken in that past, you know, that past, but we are practicing culture still today. Mm. So there is still going to be, and like we'll, like um everyone had touched on about having that future. And the future is that we also um, have scar trees. We are practicing. We do make cooler lawns. We do make all of these things. Well, in time to come, they will be on the register. And that's what I try and teach my children. That you know, I we will be the history of our our mob. So let's you know look at it that way as well. Yeah. So look, look, we'll sort of leave it with a a couple of questions that we can talk about in discussion but um, um, you know how how can we embed change to create visibility so you know with with my PhD research you know it took over 20 years to come up with you know to, to build on um, knowledge and field work experience and the exchange of knowledge between landowners and Aboriginal people about cultural heritage and identifying that um, 
and sharing information. And so those layers of history are really important. And, um, and so I developed a, a living space model system that keeps things in perspective of terms of, of um, settlement, people, longevity, um, the future. Um, and, and, and it can be shaped and it's, it's, it's a similar to a cultural mapping um, so that we can start really understanding each place and, and, and further um, add layers and more layers, like you say, add, these, add, add the contemporary layers on top of it as well. And, and education is a really good um, part of this and not just the quasi engagement, but the true engagement is a really, I get really important engaged. process. <laughs> But also with um, saying that, I have um, registered at an intangible place, which was La Lao Falls. I wrote to um, actually register that as an intangible. But I must admit, as an Aboriginal person, I'm like, why is it intangible if it's there? Why are we intangible? <laughs> why is everything intangible? Or we didn't have houses and, you know, we didn't wear clothes. Are you joking? It's cold here. We wore clothes, we <laughs> were freezing. We wore possum skin a lot. Have you worn that? It's lovely. But that's the thing. It's always a story or make-believe or, I don't oh know, he touched his axe and he became Superman. Um, all of those things. But how, if those coincide with how those landmarks, all those landmarks and all those landforms form. And the collection is yeah. invisible. Everything's invisible. And so it's by making it visible and, and the and yeah. awareness. So thank you for thank your time. you. Thank you, Heather and uh, Melinda. Um, so we are now gonna turn some questions and um there are some questions here that I've got to have a quick look at. But um, thank you very much, um, Heather and Melinda, and thanks to everyone for those presentations. I, I wanted to first start with a, with a question, just picking up on a few of the themes that have been raised in, um, in the presentations this evening. Uh, uh, we talked a lot about where heritage sits in a time dimension, whether it's in the past, in the present, in the future. And, and one of the other themes that's come through is um, particularly in, in Heather and Melinda's presentation, this idea of promoting a new dialogue, promoting an ability to read landscape and, and read country uh, in a different way and exploring opportunities for indigenous and European understandings of place and landscape to be enriched in, in that way. I wanted to put a question, I might put this in the first instance to Heather and Melinda. Um, you know, we're living in this world where heritage practice is potentially enriched and reinvigorated through an understanding of indigenous cultural practice. Is it possible, do you think, uh, to imagine this as a step towards a shared proposition of heritage in Australia, perhaps delivered in some way through systems of co-management? Is that something that's conceivable? Yes, it's sort of saying that um, the process for assessment um, is as a heritage Oh, sorry. It's probably a bit better. <laughs> um, so we, we, we're examining um, heritage and history post-colonial already. Um, there's an emphasis of that with, with um, um, cultural heritage management plans or cultural assessments. Um, so it, it's already there. There's already the... the um, as I mentioned, exchange of information um, that is occurring through the two processes. But why, why can't they be the same? Did you want to comment on that? It baffles me, but we're always separate, aren't we? Um, I suppose cultural heritage sits solo to heritage, but how when, I, I don't understand, to be honest. I, I don't see why. I do question that a lot. And I think we all should question that globally and say, well, how come Australian cultural heritage is separate to heritage? I think that's something everyone could help with because I feel that it, it is, it, it's wrong 
you know, in many forms of, of why I could list a million things why, but I do feel that why is mine always looked as something to be, um, yeah, hidden. I suppose it's hidden. You, you only know that if you're in planning. I suppose that there's a cultural heritage management plan. I know they're becoming more, um, you know, out there and understanding that people do have to do these things. But I think also it's taking away from what it means because I feel really, I'm probably, I don't think there's many heritage advisors. Apparently I bat for the other team um, in the Aboriginal world being a heritage advisor. There's not many of us, um, but I think why can't we be in all of it? I want to be what I want. If I want to be a heritage advisor, if I want to be an archaeologist, if I want to be an architect, if I want to be anything, I will, I'll go get it. I want to be it. But when it comes to heritage advisor, generally it didn't sit with an Aboriginal person. But now being in it, I'm like, well, why can't I write this in there? And I've tested the waters. Heather and I have tested the waters many a times, um, expect, especially when we um, co well, I co-authored with Heather with the um, distinctive area and landscapes of the Ballerine. Um, I must say we did try to write homes. Yeah. It kind of got taken out, didn't it? <laughs> um, so we did try to use different language to say that there were homes, but uh, it was they, it was a mystery. It kind of left the paper, the word. So um, we had to call it living spaces. Thank you. Are, are there any questions from the floor? Please put your hand up if, if there's a question you wanted to put to any of the panelists. Okay. If not, what, one of the other things that I want, this is a really broad question, but, and I'll perhaps um, put it to, um, in the first instance, I think Richard, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but that, that just touching on the, that idea of, whether heritage, I mean, heritage is challenged and you talked about it in your presentation. It's sort of quite a static proposition. It's not reviewed, it's not reanalyzed. It's, it's, it's for reasons that I think we understand, but um, just engaging with that at a sort of conceptual level, do, do you regard heritage as a, as a proposition that sits in the past, in the present or in the future? Or is it a composite of, of all of the above? Oh, sir. Yeah, I think it's all of the above. Um, and I think the thing that strikes me about sort of several of the, the sort of ideas flowing through all the conversations is about making the conversation and the knowledge visible. Um, because we've really been talking about how to bring it out into the open and create a conversation, contested conversations by all means, but ways of making it visible so that it can actually um, become part of people's lived experience rather than sort of embedded. Everybody has their own sort of personal sense of heritage and mm. like, um, but if you look around, if you look at, at buildings, you'd think, you'd think buildings would be the most obvious sort of things of heritage that are recognizable and are visible, but in, other, in, in another sense, all their stories are actually quite, quite embedded. And the kind of things Paul's been talking about, and then and the others has really been about bringing those stories out and finding ways of making them visible, whether through that kind of artistic interpretation, through cultural practices and making cultural practice and knowledge visible. Um, and I'm not convinced that we're necessarily, I'm very conscious there's a whole series of reports and knowledge and information that sits within all the heritage practitioners here. And yet there's no real ray of, of bringing it up collectively to make it a kind of collective endeavor. Just um, just quickly on yep. that too, with the, par the parallel of, of, you know, heritage and cultural heritage. Um, when undertaking field work over a number of years on generational landowner properties, um, there was 90% uh, of the time a house that had been built from bluestone in the 1840s on a property that was a parallel to a living space, um, Aboriginal living space. So we're, we're always, we are, the, that notion of home, that sense of um, identity of place has these histories. Why not combine the two of them? It enhances heritage. 
and like you said maybe the name can be reviewed but there's this is something it is it is you know the, the, those layers are there the evidence is there so you know it, it's already a crossover sure paul, paul just wondering if you've got anything you wanted to add to this this thing or whether we move to the next question okay um the next question with oh, um so there's a question another one from melinda and heather um given the underlying so it's just moved. Given the underlying ideology on which the borough charter was established dates back to the time First Nation people were counted as wildlife, is it now an appropriate time to start the discussion on the need to develop a new doctrine that is not only cross-cultural collaboration, but is built upon an integrated foundation inclusive of caring for country? Yes. I'm separate. Well, that... I mean, I think Melinda has has touched upon that, that, um, you know, this is something that needs to time, you know, we, we should think about this now because, um, you know, and we should move in a slow pace to make things um, visible for the future and that includes connection to country and from Aboriginal perspective. And, you know, because we're in a almost era of, of fashion of Aboriginality, aren't we, Melinda? It's everywhere. Um, and that's good that we're moving into this direction, but people are also catching up and there's a lot of trauma and there's, um, you know, shift and change and then things are happening to country, like I mentioned, where the land formations are shifting and that recognisable elements are, are being removed. And so we... we we, it, it is time to think about this. Um, the acts have been in place for a little while now, but we're living a different life. Um, we're moving at a different pace. So it is time to slow down. And that's why historically pandemics and things such as, you know, vast change for society and humanity always shifts um, the level of the way we, we look at things and it always goes back before moving forward. Um, there is another question. Taking into account the cover photo, which was the one with the, um, I think it's on the previous slide. No. That photo is the one that's being referred to. With the spray statue spray painted, no pride in genocide, can the experts advise how to acknowledge Indigenous cultural heritage and colonial settlements side by side in a truthful way? without offending people or cancelling culture. Be key, if, 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 I don't know, Amy, if you, you have, we haven't heard from you, I don't know if you've got a... a... I'm, not a I'm not a heritage expert. I, I, I suppose I'm an expert in this thing called engagement, whatever that means. But, um, it, you know, it is about, I don't want to say giving people a voice, but, um, you know, it is about bringing in the diversity of the voice, but not having isolated conversations um, and reflecting on my practice that when we need to do First Nations engagement, it is something that's bolted on to the rest of the engagement because we're not specialists in that space. So it got me reflecting that we need to create forums where we can have the diversity of the community in the room all, all parts of the community for that sharing and that connection and the storytelling because I think the, the best way to break down barriers between different types of humans is through storytelling and it is by giving people the time and the space so I know that I'll walk away tonight and think about doing things a bit differently just from your presentation so thank you that's great well look unless there are any questions from the floor oh sorry Paul sorry I had a, a call, I think it was this morning, um, and it was from um, developers in um, the outskirts of Perth, and they uh, had been reading um, a cultural context document that um, we had put together concerning probably about 15 kilometer stretch of of railway and uh, this is a through an aboriginal consultancy there and so it was an elder based 
um, study of the associations of that country. And we, we presented <clears throat> our report, an important feature of it was that um, we'd done a lot of these and pretty much all of the railway tracks out of Perth follow Biddy, they follow the old tracks. So that was the first point. In other words, you were already on Runga country and beneficiaries of Runga wisdom and care and culture just by virtue of having that transportation or communication route open. And there was a sub-story there about the, the guides that Runga had um, offered to assist that initial um, engagement with the country. So the question they had was, um, oh, have you done a heritage report on this? And I thought, well, we went through the best we could. We went through a process of, um, of delegation of authority and the elders deciding amongst themselves who would speak for which, for which and how and whatever. And then we were um, able to do a set of interviews, and of course, backed up by looking at uh, the stories that hold that whole country together. But the interesting thing was that we were trying to, what we made very clear is that there is not a heritage site here. Um, what there is is a living connection of, of to country, which is uh, a very complex interrelationship between, in this case, we're looking a lot at Banksias, for example, you know, the seasonality of the Banksia harvest, the importance of the social events associated with it, the importance of the migration routes up and down. So all of that was in there. Um, but they said, well, have you done a heritage report? I said, no, we weren't asked to do that, but we have provided you in our report with the heritage registered sites. And they're all small sites, and they're very much talking about intangible there's nothing intangible about these sites. They're sites of, of, of human memory. Um, they're sites of meeting, passing on knowledge. They're sites of education and so on. But it's true on the register, it's just a little kind of mark and it says artifact scatter or uh, mythological significance. Now, that is, there's no problem about the mythological significant remaining secret, so it should. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was that I was saying, look, but there, this is, forget all that stuff. The fact is, what the elders are telling us is that it's all connected. And so the railway is not, you've just got a hot spot here where you have to sort of bend the rail or something. The whole thing is a vibrating string of hurt and pain across damaged countries. So that's where they were saying, the elders were saying, turn truth telling is not simply about um, disposition. It's also about the continuing uh, misunderstanding that you're on country this is what they were telling us but it's very interesting it's very quite hard to communicate that and so well we, we, we just need to know what's on the heritage register and well you can be assured that what's on the heritage register is is misrepresents completely uh, it's a little bit like the biddy the word they use biddy and i'm sure it's in, in your culture too it's, it's the vein it's the vein in the hand so if you want to cut the vein uh, then of course you you kill the living body thank, thank you paul um, there's, we'll take one more question before handing to Richard Mackay. Um, and this is a question to Richard Gillespie. Um, do listed heritage places ever get removed from registers in Australia? Can they be deaccessioned to make space for new heritage make for new heritage making as you reflected on? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm probably not the right, I threw out the challenge rather than know what kind of practice and somebody here may be able to talk more about um, whether items have come off registers. Um, <laughs> but um, I don't see why not, you know, um, that the same kind of process of reviewing why things go on should should just simply apply to why why things might be taken off. Um, Yes, one way to do it is to demolish the building when it's on the register. Um, but it's more, it's more, I think, thinking, you know, what I was really trying to encourage is thinking holistically about the, about, you know, complete assemblages of collections yeah. and then starting to make some deliberation around sort of what, where the energy should really go. That may then think and stay on the register, but then get treated in different kinds of ways and not everything does. In practice now get treated in exactly the same way they're flags for, for for consideration but at the moment we don't really have necessarily the kind of mechanisms for 
applying in a sort of interrelated way how those different sites would be would be managed sure. on on the, on that deaccessioning issue the other thing of course is that we're talking about creative practice is creative practice is a great way of deaccessioning um, if you think about you know, counter monuments or anti monument movements, um, the complexification of the past, which is possible, particularly through an artwork which doesn't hopefully um, have one particular message, but sets up through uh, its its media uh, an, a situation of interpretation where you start to see things differently. You see the shadows. You start to feel different aspects of what's there. Can itself be um, a deaccessioning process what it takes it removes the monument from its from its pedestal and starts to see it from a very different perspective and then um without necessarily its immediate physical destruction its recontextualization um can go some way towards that deaccessioning thanks paul um well look i, I think that we'll wrap up there um and i'll, I'll just um Sorry, um, before handing to, to Richard Mackay, just wanted to, to reflect that um, this evening was framed, uh, as I said at the beginning, as an opportunity to open up a discussion, um, to explore opportunities for us as, as heritage practitioners, um, uh, to learn from aligned professions and, um, uh, and collaborators, and possibly to, and I think desirably, to, to refresh our approach to the work that we do how we do it and, and, and who we do it with, the partnerships that we work in. Um, I think in, in reflecting on, on, on what we've heard and what we've learned, um, the profound opportunities do exist to open up new forms of dialogue, to explore understandings of connection to place that derive from indigenous cultural practice, that um, the interconnectedness of everything, we've just heard that point made in a different context by Richard Gillespie, um, living in a world that sustains us. I mean, this fundamentally relates to some of the, the fundamental issues of our time in, in the context of, of heritage practice themes of sustainability, well-being, and of course reconciliation. Um, the idea and the need to, to, to listen to others. Um, in, in, in some cultures, uh, storytelling as a process of cultural continuity is, is um, more innate than others. Um, but I would observe that storytelling and narrative uh, and conceptions of narrative as being a common theme in many of the presentations this evening, um, which is really heartening. Um, I'd say finally um, that there's a need for us to guard against complacency, to, to be open to different ways of thinking, um, to seek opportunities for heritage practice and process to, to play an active role in supporting societal and, and cultural priorities. Um, and with that, I'll close there, but I, I'd like you to all join me in thanking very much the, the panelists for their time, insights, and thanks. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand to Richard Mackay um, to tell us more about the General Assembly. Thank you, Adam. And I, I begin by acknowledging that we've met this evening on Wurundjeri lands. I, I thank Philip for his acknowledgement of country. I pay my respects to elders past and present, extending those respects to Aboriginal people who are with us this evening and noting that the event about which I'm going to tell you is graciously hosted on the land of the Gadigal, also land that was um, was never ceded. I'd like to thank um, Akahutch for hosting us this evening and particularly thank Lovell Chen for organ organising this evening's event as a small vignette and a teaser taste of just one of the kinds of things that you might be able to experience at the ICOMOS General Assembly, which is being hosted in Sydney from August 31 through to 9 September later this year. I, I guess most of you know, but ICOMOS is the International Council on uh, Monuments and Sites. That's monuments, not monuments. Um, and it is, it's the Global Heritage Organization. And, and I'd say um, perhaps um, to Melinda that we can talk about this heritage, cultural heritage thing, because I think ICOMOS is a, is a very inclusive organisation that welcomes um, a, a holistic understanding of cultural heritage. So this is the global organisation for, for those who are involved in the heritage sector. Um, and it is the first time 
that the global meeting will be held in Australia or the Pacific. And it's only possible with a vast array of Australian state and local support. Um, it'll be a sustainable event. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in coming, please book through our website with Qantas because you'll get discounts and you'll also help our carbon neutrality aspirations. And um, I've got a few slides, so I'm not going to read everything that's on the screen, but it's a combination of business meetings, but also a scientific symposium, a gathering of youth and emerging professionals, a public exhibition, a, a vast number of side events and tours, and I just encourage you to get around it. Um, you're already aware that the theme is heritage changes, and there are a series of sub themes about resilience, responsibility, rights and relationships, and these will be explored through programs that look at questions of Indigenous heritage here and abroad, um, the culture nature journey, the, the rights based approaches to involvement of traditional custodians in, in what are traditionally regarded as natural places, um, looking at heritage climate and heritage and its role in sustainability and digital heritage. And let me say, we've had one thought provoking and informative session here this evening. During the course of this event in Sydney in September, um, the program has just been um, announced and there are 88 sessions from which you can, can choose over the course of the week in a very diverse format. Some with discussions, some with um, uh, papers, some with workshops, some with site visits, and concluding with um, a World Heritage Panel session as we lead into the 45th session of the World Heritage Committee, which will follow immediately in Saudi Arabia. Um, we've, Adam's already spoken about the theme of heritage changes, but it seeks to examine the tumultuous changes that are taking place in this field in the first years of the 2020s. The climate emergencies, COVID, lockdowns, closed borders, virtual meetings, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of these things have proud, profoundly affected and altered the ways in which we're her experiencing our heritage. So we're looking at what's changed and what needs to change. And, for, and what does heritage change? For example, the environment, the economy, a number of the themes that we have explored this evening. And I, and I also thank the, the panellists, Paul, Richard, um, Heather, Melinda and, and Amy for their contributions. And I sincerely hope that you will bring those thoughts and ideas and join us in Sydney at some similarly provocative and, and engaging panels. I mentioned the Youth Forum. For the many young people I can see in the audience, um, please put this in your diaries. It's a chance to um, collaborate and meet young people involved in this sector from around the, around the world. Um, there's been a, a, a competitive selective process. We've just finished round two. Round three will open soon. The good news is there's still about 50 places left. Um, two to three day program hosted as an interactive series of workshops and camp on Cockatoo Island, a component of the, um, uh, uh, sorry, I should say Cockatoo Island Wariema, um, part of the Australian Convict Sites World Heritage Property. And it's being organised by a very active committee of ICOMOS young professionals. There is also a very broad public program. Um, there'll be a major exhibition across five days at Darling Harbour, a heritage trades fair, um, for those of you who are looking to participate, there's about two booths that are still available and see me afterwards. Um, we have 30 international ICOMOS scientific committees. Uh, these are the committees in which people get involved in heritage history and conservation or in wood conservation or in Antarctic heritage. These are all the specialists. All 30 of them are meeting in Sydney, some with workshops, some with events. All of them will have a display in the heritage exposition and all of them will be available to meet um, and engage with and learn about. There is a terrific social event um, and side event program. And the hot news is, and, and this is the bit, this, if you only listen to one bit, listen to this. If you go online and register next week, after we put out our next newsletter, for those of you who receive it, and if you don't get online and subscribe, the final side event program with the juiciest set of social events, workshops, behind the scenes tours, is going to be available towards the end of next week. Get in first before your mates book. So registering next week will put you at the head of that queue. And what have we got? We've got an opening ceremony, including a, an opera highlights performance at Sydney Opera House. We're taking over Luna Park, Sydney, just for fun. Um, Hyde Park Barracks and the Opera House will both have behind the tours inspections with the, with the conservation crew. There is a public lecture um, hosted by the City of Sydney at the Town Hall. 
a climate change and Pacific seminar at the Australian Museum, not on screen, but just finalised today. There will be a one day symposium on the 31st of August about the Murujuga um, cultural landscape in Northwestern Australia, Australia's most recent nomination to the World Heritage Committee. And the Murujuga community, community are coming in number and they're bringing their colleagues from around Australia and around the world. It will be an extraordinary event. 31 August, Sydney. Um, if, you, if you want to know about our most recent nomination to the World Heritage List, that is the place to be. Um, the Lord Mayor's hosting a reception. We're having a gala dinner. Adam's giving me a wind up. Um, you get to go out to the Greater Blue Mountains for a day, hosted by the Gund our friends of the Gundungara, um, with the collaboration of the National Trust and the National Park Service, a focus on the cultural heritage of this million hectare World Heritage property. Um, there are a whole series of tours. So um, while obviously it's, a, it's a, big, um, a, a big undertaking to come to Sydney for 10 days and participate in this event, mindful that we're being joined by our colleagues from around the world, there are a whole series of associated events where you will get to meet the people, go behind the scenes and engage with these cultural heritage places in ways that you would not always uh, otherwise be able to do. So that's just something else to think about. And uh, of course, if I didn't believe in the product, I wouldn't be doing this commercial. Um, let me say that the very modest cost for registration, um, 10 day event for 750 bucks if you're a member and you've still got time to apply, 400 bucks if you're a student um, is only possible because about half the funding is provided by government and a quarter of the funding is provided by very generous uh, corporate sponsors. And so I, I, th I thank our major corporate patrons, a couple of whom, three of whom are represented in this room, um, Lovell Chen hosting this event amongst them, um, but also a large number of other corporate patrons who are providing support and for different components of this very complex event. Uh, look closely, if you know somebody who's on screen, please tell them you saw me show their logo to this event. <laughs> or if you happen to be the CEO of one of these organizations, please note that your logo was there and it was very big. Um, and of course, a whole lot of government um, partners. Um, and we are just being absolutely magnificently supported by organizations like the Sydney Opera House, the Park Service, the National Trust, Lunar Park, the Australian Museum, et cetera. Um, so it's a place to be. A 10 day program commencing in late August, running through until 9th of September with tours um, before and after. And um, I look forward to you joining me in Sydney in August and September, a little later on this year. Thank you.